Zealand's history. I call Dennis O'Rourke. Dean's Bush, with its remnant of Kahikatea Forest and the Dean's homestead since 19, uh, rather 1843, is an, ex, is an area of extraordinary beauty on the banks of the Avon River in Christchurch, as we all know. It is therefore a very important Christchurch city asset, one of many assets in Christchurch that should never be sold. The current Act, and now this Bill, will continue to ensure this, we hope. This property has been well cared for, but I think only since about 1990, using ratepayers' money, and that needs to continue. Before that, in fact, the property fell into disrepair. In the early 1990s, were the first time that the Christchurch City Council committed adequate funding necessary for the preservation of this house and the grounds, including Rickett and Bush behind it. I was a member of the Council from 1989 to 2004, and I remember going to the property, inspecting the roof, the unsafe rooms that could not be used in the house, the fencing and the state of the bush itself. And the fencing was important because uh, cats and dogs and all sorts of other animals were able to enter and do damage to that valuable piece of Kahikatea, Kahikatea Forest in Christchurch. So we committed as a council voluntarily the funding necessary to make sure that the past regime of ne neglect would all change. And what we see now is a property that we can all be proud of, despite the earthquake damage which it has received. We did know that it was worth preserving because it was valued by the people of Christchurch and still is, all of whom can, of course, visit the property free of charge. And I'm glad to see today in the press that the Earthquake Appeal Trust has given $128,000 to repair the building after the earthquake damage it has received. And this, together with insurance money from the property, will ensure the building's survival in the future. This bill will help to ensure the ongoing maintenance of the house and Rickett and Bush, and that's what all Canterbury people want to see. But what about other Christchurch heritage buildings? The Minister in charge of this bill and of the Canterbury earthquake recovery knows that he has the powers and that Sarah has the powers under the Sarah Act to ensure that buildings like Rickerton House are preserved and ultimately restored in whole or in part. So as others have said, what about the Christchurch Anglican Cathedral? Why is that different from Rickerton House? Jerry Brownlee has said that it's a matter for the church, but that's not correct. Jerry Brownlee knows that it's not just a matter for the church, it's a matter for the whole community and I think for this parliament as well. Like Rickett and Bush and House, where there is a trust board, so is there a trust board for the cathedral. And there is a, an act under which that trust board operates for the cathedral. So it's very much like the situation with Rickett and House. So why has no action been taken at all on the preservation of the most important building in the city and one of the most important buildings in New Zealand in terms of heritage, and that is the Christchurch Anglican Cathedral? It obviously can be preserved just in the same way as Rickett and House is being preserved, in whole or in part. The whole Canterbury community contributed to the construction and maintenance of the Christchurch Cathedral, including a lot of council ratepayer funding. And I was on the council when that was committed, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So it's not just a church concern, it's not just a church asset, it's a community asset. The Minister and Sarah must act now to apply the funding they have, which includes provision for heritage buildings, to save the cathedral and in due course to see that it is restored, at least in part. Many Cantabrians want answers on that and they want them now. For the same reasons, this Rickett and Bush Amendment Bill should now be supported. It updates the old 1947 Act, as we know. Uh, the new sections 5 and 5A in Clause 14, Part 2, provide for a board of nine people, 
five appointed by the City Council, two of whom must be community board members. The Dean's family appoint two. The Royal Society, one, and the board itself can appoint one as well. That's an appropriate mix of members of the board, and the Council supplies the money, and it's therefore appropriate on behalf of the community that it should appoint five out of the uh, nine board members. The reservations that New Zealand first had when the bill was introduced relate to some aspects of the financial plan. The City Council in new section 23.3 in clause 10 part 1 could only approve and not disapprove of the financial plan, which was a defect. It was actually not good law to make it possible for the Council only to approve the plan and not able to disapprove it. The Local Government Select Committee has recommended that this be remedied by the addition of new subsection 23.3a, which says, quote, if the Council does not approve the draft financial plan, a, the Council must provide its reasons for not doing so to the Board, and b, the Board must, within 90 days after receiving those reasons, deliver a revised draft financial plan to the Council. This meets, Mr Speaker, New Zealand First's concerns, as expressed in my speech some weeks ago, by allowing the Council not to approve the financial plan and to give its reasons. The Board must then provide a revised plan within 90 days, and the Council has a majority, as I've said, of appointees on the Board, including two Community Board people, and so should be able to influence the Board to ensure that a sensible and achievable, and I might say affordable, plan is achieved. In this way, we can be confident that an appropriate balance between the Board's aspirations for funding of its financial plan is achieved within reason and within prudential limits, while on the other hand protecting the interests of ratepayers who will in the end be the funders. So I'm glad to see that the concerns I expressed when the bill was introduced have been met in this way. And uh, therefore New Zealand First can now support the bill without reservation. But Mr Speaker, I do want to finish by again pointing out the inconsistency between what we see here with this piece of legislation and the very welcome intention to ensure that Rickerton House, as a very important heritage building, is preserved and ultimately restored. In fact, it's been substantially restored, except for earthquake damage, and that will be done, as I've said. The inconsistency between that and what we see about the, the Christchurch Cathedral in Cathedral Square possibly one of the most important heritage buildings in the whole country. So there, there is a gross inconsistency between the way that Rickerton House is being dealt with and the way that the, the cathedral is not being dealt with. And I put it to Jerry Brownlee, who is the sponsor of this bill and is also responsible for the Canterbury earthquake recovery, to see that he acts consistently and actually does something about the heritage buildings in Christchurch which have not been attended to so far. Christchurch people are still waiting to hear what the plan for the preservation of the heritage buildings in Christchurch are. Why is there this silence? Why is Jerry Brownlee silent? Why is Sarah silent? Why is nothing being done about that cathedral? It is high time that it was. This piece of legislation demonstrates the inconsistency and the incompetence of both the Minister and of Sarah with regard to heritage buildings in Christchurch. And it is no wonder, Mr Speaker, that people are getting so upset. And if you were in Christchurch, you would know how upset people are. And I am upset. And we should all be upset to see a, a building like the Christchurch Cathedral being ignored in this way. It's high time that we saw action happen, as it is with Rickerton, Book, with Rickerton House. I call Nikki Kay. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to be speaking.